Jagardif, Jaya Masters. Spiritual growth is actually very, very simple. We make it very, very difficult, therefore it's difficult. What is really going on in the deepest sense? There is this thing called consciousness, awareness. Awareness of what? Everything. Awareness is just awareness. Just like a light can shine on many things, but it's the same light. The sun shines on everything, but it's just the sun. It's just light falling on things. The light is the same. The light emanating from the sun is the same. The rays are the same. They fall on different things, illumine different things. Therefore, the things look different because they're illumined and lit up by the light. But the light is not different just because it's hitting different things or shining on different things. That shouldn't be hard to understand. It's reasonable. Consciousness, that's what they call it, the light of consciousness. Because the properties of consciousness are similar, not the same as, but similar to the properties of light. Consciousness shines or emanates or projects onto objects. The consciousness doesn't actually go anywhere. The sun doesn't go anywhere. It just sits out there 93 million miles away and it emanates. I like that word. It emanates itself. The rays are no different than the sun. They're just emanating from the sun. So consciousness doesn't go anywhere. You can sit in this chair or wherever you're sitting and you can look at your hand. Then you're conscious of your hand. If you really stare at your hand, focus completely on your hand, then there's nothing else anywhere because your consciousness is only aware of your hand. If you take your hand down, you see a broad spectrum. You didn't go anywhere. You just stopped focusing your consciousness on a particular object. And all of a sudden your consciousness is able to fall on more things. Like a light that's focused one pointedly on something, a spotlight, versus a broad beam of light. So your consciousness can focus anywhere you want it into a tiny little spot. Just focus on that. Or it can focus on everything. But you didn't go anywhere, did you? Please understand this. You're just like the sun. The sun stays where it is, but it shines. So your consciousness emanates out, but it can focus on a given object. Another way to feel the nature of consciousness is your body. If you focus on your toe, especially if a hammer falls on your toe, it will happen naturally, all of your consciousness will go to your toe. You won't feel your hand, you won't feel your head, you won't feel your thighs, you only feel your toe. But right now, I don't want you to move, don't do anything. Can you feel your whole body? Can you feel your whole body? Can you feel your feet? Don't touch them, I just want to know. Do you know you have feet? How do you know? You feel them, don't you? Can you feel your hands and your feet at the same time? Can you feel your arms and your hands and your legs and your feet at the same time? Or you can feel just your toe. So consciousness is able to be everywhere in your body. It's not in one place, then you move it somewhere. You can focus on just one thing, and you do if something hurts more than something else, or something feels good more than something else, you focus on it. But that's consciousness focusing on it. It doesn't have to. I, I love what we just did. This is yoga. We're talking something very deep. The fact that you can feel your whole body simultaneously. What's the time difference between when you feel your hand and you feel your feet? Zero. They're simultaneous. Nothing has to go anywhere. Why? Because it's everywhere. So in relationship to your body, your consciousness is omnipresent. Is it not true that your consciousness is simultaneously on every part of your body if you want it to? All right? If you focus on it. Well, that's that's pretty neat. But you can also focus it on something smaller. The consciousness did not change. You did not move. You didn't do anything. It's just a question of focus, focus of consciousness. Okay. If you get that, and I know you do, the rest is simple. The rest, I'm telling you, 
It's not simple to do. Like right now I said, can you feel your body all at once? You said yes. Have you ever got lost in thought? Okay, what does that mean? Who got lost? Your consciousness was not focused on your body. Did you still have a body? I bet you weren't feeling your feet and your hands. You were focused on your thoughts. Where did you have to go to get focused on your thoughts? Nowhere. Is it the same consciousness that got lost in your thought as the consciousness that was feeling your hands and your feet, but you weren't focusing on your hands and feet, you were focused on your thoughts? What about your feelings? Do any of you ever have feelings? Emotions, that kind, of, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? I don't have to describe it, do I? Can you get lost in your emotions? Can you just, can't think straight? Since this happened or since she died or since he left me, I can't even think straight. I can't do any math. I can't go to school. I can't do anything. I'm an emotional mess. Whoa, congratulations. Can you feel your body? No. Can you use your mind? No. Did your mind break? No. It's the same mind. Did your body break? No. It's the same body. It's just that your consciousness, which is the same consciousness, is now absorbed, focused, lost in your emotions. That's pretty important to know that that can happen. In fact, my new book, Living Untethered, it starts with the premise that you're in there and that you can be focused on your mind, you can be focused on your emotions, you can be focused on your body, or you can get lost in an object in the outside world. I call it a three-ring circus. The outside, the heart, and the mind. Then the question becomes, who are you that is experiencing this? Because it's the same you who gets lost in your emotions, but what about if you have a really bad emotion? Really bad one, jealousy, insecurity, fear, something like that. Let's say I have a really good emotion. Love, excitement, proud. Is it the same you that experiences both of those? Is it the same you that experiences your emotion when they're messed up as the you experiences your emotion when they're wonderful? Obviously, it's the same you. That word I, you use the word I. I was feeling terrible, then I was feeling good. I was really upset. Then something happened, and then somebody called, and I was doing much better. I, 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 I. You use the word I for your focus of consciousness. Okay? It's the same. You have no idea how important this is. Believe it or not, this is the essence of spirituality. What is? Your emotions are not the essence of spirituality. You who's aware of your emotions is the essence of spirituality. You're the consciousness. Your mind is neither good nor bad nor right nor wrong. It's something you're aware of. Are you aware that sometimes you have bad thoughts? Are you aware that sometimes you have good thoughts? Are you aware that sometimes it gets quiet? I hope. That sometimes it's not so noisy in there? Can you go, and most cannot, but it's okay. Can you go deep in meditation and come back and say, wow, that's the first time my thoughts completely stopped. There were no thoughts. How do you know? It is not as important that there were no thoughts as it is who was there when there were thoughts and who was there when there weren't thoughts. Who was there when love was flowing? And who was there when insecurity and fear and jealousy were flowing? Isn't it the same you? That's what it means by the self. That is what the Atman is. That is what the soul is. The essence of your being. You can be aware of lots of things. Your foot, your hand, your mind, your thoughts, your emotions. <laughs> oh, proliferate, right? How many things can you be aware of? A clock, a picture, a wall, a knot in the wall. Oh, lots of things you can be aware of, can't you? It's always the same you, though, isn't it? So if someone says, what is the essence of your being? It is your consciousness. It's not your body. Why? Because your body is just something you're aware of. As your body get older, was your body once this big, a foot big? Is it the same you in there? Were you aware when you were five years old, going through your little dramas and wanting things and so on, were you in there? Are you in there now? I go through this in the book. When you looked in the mirror when you're 10, you looked in the mirror. There's a reflection. Was it the same reflection you see now? Was it the same you looking? These are the essence of spiritual questions. Not how long can you meditate or what mantra are you using. This is, who are you? I like when people say, I'm going to India, someplace in the Himalayas, because I want to find myself. You who's looking is the self. There is one part of your being that is always there. That's yourself. The fact that yourself has the problem of getting identified with what it's looking at as opposed to always identifying with itself as the essence. This is, I am the essence of being. 
Sometimes I see this. Sometimes I see that. Sometimes I hear this. Sometimes my mind is noisy. It's always the same me. If you understand that, you are well on your way to a spiritual journey. Because the only problem is you don't have to find yourself. You are the self. You're always the self. The problem is, and there is a problem, that you identify with what you're looking at or listening to. We call it the object of consciousness as opposed to identifying with the consciousness. If it's always you in there, then why don't you just be you? You'll never have another problem for the rest of your life, I assure you. Never. You'll sit there and say, boy, is my mind messed up. How about you? I'm not messed up. I'm just noticing a mind that's messed up. Yesterday it was fine. Then somebody said something, and whoo, now it's going to be weird. Do you care? Why would I care? It'll change tomorrow, don't worry. You just go through its change. What about your emotions? They're hilarious, like popcorn. You look at someone and say, hey, Joan, and she doesn't turn around for the rest of the day. She's doing all kind of weird stuff. Well, what did I do wrong? What did I say? So there's nothing wrong with that. Real spirituality doesn't tell you, stop your mind, make sure your emotions are nice. It sits there and says, be you. Be the self. Be the self. Know that I am the self. And there's a mind in there that gets weird. There's a heart in there that gets weird. There's a body in there that can feel really good, can feel tired, can feel pain. I can do all kinds of things, doesn't it? How do you know? How do you know you're hungry? How do you know your toe hurts? Because I'm conscious. And you eventually come back to realize that is the essence of your being, the essence of spirituality. Now, at some point, somebody who hasn't explored this deep enough could say, well, so what? What's that got to do with my life? How about everything? What do you mean? We know that the body has a nature. It can feel pleasure, it can feel pain, it can feel hot, it can feel cold, it can feel hungry, it can feel satisfied, it has drives. The body has a nature. How do you know? Because I'm conscious. The mind has a nature. Psychology studies it all the time. Mommy did that to you when you were young, now you're this. Now the mind gets this way, the emotions are a different way, it gets a different thing to happen to you. How do you know? How do you know? You're in there. That's how you know. The heart's just emanating emotions. You're the one who's conscious of them. And so eventually you come down to the point that every part of your being, your mind has a nature. Psychology studies that. Your emotions have a nature. They study that too. Why are you being the way you are? Because mommy did this and that. That's Freud. So he did something. And it left it in there since you're little and now you're sensitive about, yeah, sensitive about some subjects. That's because it's in there. So go study psychology. It's fine. It's wonderful. But more important, spirituality doesn't study psychology. Some people say spiritual and psychology are the same. It's, it's very important that you work through your psychology so that you're not so caught in your psychology that you understand that you're the one who's noticing your psychology. You're noticing that the heart hurts. You're noticing that the heart's happy. You're noticing that it fell in love. What happened? What do you mean it fell in love? There's all these beautiful energy and beautiful emotions coming up from my heart, aiming out towards somebody. How do you know? How do you know that's happening? Because I'm in here. Spirituality is about who's in there. Psychology is about why are these things happening. That's the human aspect of your being. But like some people say, I'm only human. How do you know? Just keep coming back to how do you know? And you will eventually realize that you who's in there, the essence of your being, not your thoughts about you, but you who notices the thoughts, has a nature. That's spirituality. Not studying psychology, the nature of the mind the nature of the heart, or physiology, the nature of the body. Those are good things. There's nothing wrong with studying and learning about those things. But understand that you are the consciousness that is aware of those things. You are not those things. If the mind stops talking, you're still there. If the mind gets noisy, you're still there. If the heart's filled with love, you're still there. If the heart hurts a lot, you're still there. It's you. What is the nature of self? What is the nature of Atman? What is the nature of soul? It has a nature. But you don't know that. Why? Because if the sun is in the sky shining all these beautiful rays, but you're only paying attention to what they fall on. Look, look how pretty that is. Look how broken that is. You know, it's just, it's illuminating. If it wasn't there, it'd be dark. You wouldn't see anything. But it's illuminating things, and you're only paying attention to what it's illuminating. You're not paying attention to the nature of light or the nature of the, of the source of light. And that's what we do with the self. We pay attention to what consciousness falls on the emotions, the thoughts, the this, what we see through our eyes, pick up through our senses. Consciousness is what's aware of that. All the rest is something you're aware of. We say subject, object. The consciousness is the subject. It's always the same, but there's all these objects. What would happen? 
and we'll, we'll, we'll teach how in a moment, but what would happen if you managed to not do that? Not do what? Not have thoughts? No, I didn't say that. Not get lost in the thoughts enough to where you think they're you. The teachings are as follows. If your mind says, I loved him so much, how could he have left me? That is no different than your mind saying, look, there's a cloud out there. It's a thought. All thoughts are the same. There's something that emanate from your psyche, and you are the consciousness that's experiencing them. What would happen if you, that's called, you're realizing yourself here, getting to know self. What would happen if you didn't get pulled down? They have a power. Thoughts have a power. Emotions have a power. They pull your conscious into them. Just like if a hammer falls on your toe, how can you pay attention to your toe? That's the stupidest place to pay attention to. It hurts. Why are you paying attention to it? Because pain draws your consciousness into it. It distracts you, doesn't it? It distracts your consciousness to focus on the source of pain. Your heart does the same thing. It distracts you. Your emotions distract you. Your thoughts do the same thing, don't they? They distract your consciousness and they pull it down into your thoughts, into your emotions, into your body, and into the world. There's a boat. I want that boat. And next thing you know, your whole inside is focused on a boat. Okay, what would happen, just for kicks, if that didn't happen? What do you mean? What would happen if somehow, and we'll talk about it, but I want to talk about a high spiritual state for a moment. What would happen if your consciousness, your center of consciousness, as we call it, the center of consciousness, the source of where your consciousness is emanating from, do you feel your heart pull you into it? Do you feel emotions pull? Hard to not do it, isn't it? They keep pulling. Have you ever had thoughts you can't get rid of? What do you mean you can't get rid of them? They're yours, but they keep pulling you into them. That pull is what I'm talking about. What if you became a great being, just touch, 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 you're all now great beings, and that didn't happen anymore? I didn't have emotions. No, you have emotions. I didn't have thoughts. Yes, you have thoughts, but you don't get pulled into them. You stay centered, clear, in the seat of self, and you feel the nature of your being, being aware of the thought. If you don't want to be aware of it, I told you to send your consciousness down to your foot, didn't I? And then your hands. You did it, didn't you? No problem. Well, who said it has to go down to the thought? I say, you have a thought. Boss tells you to come in and talk to me tomorrow. You feel uncomfortable about it. I don't know what he's going to talk about. What did I do wrong? Your mind can do that, can't it? (laughs) Okay? And you feel anxiety. So what? That's a stupid place to put your consciousness. It's not going to fix anything. You're going to find out tomorrow what happens. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to sleep well that night and not worry about anything and just say to the thoughts, it's okay. I'm not going to pay attention to you right now. I won't suppress you. You just do whatever you want. I'm going to stay seated in the seat of consciousness. And what would that be like? Consciousness has a nature. Its nature is beyond your comprehension. And that's why people miss spirituality. The nature of consciousness itself is ecstasy. Why? There's no why. It's its nature. It feels joy. It feels love. It feels inspiration. It's expansive. You just feel this tremendous, expansive energy moving all through you and above you, and you're just emanating this light like the sun does. If you're not focusing what the rays fall on and you focus on the sun, that's a whole other experience, isn't it? That's the light of consciousness. That's the source and the nature and the seat of consciousness. You are the sun. You are a pure, beautiful, beautiful being made in the image of God. That's what's back there. How you like that, <laughs> right? So if you want to understand spirituality, Muktananda said it very nicely. Meditate on the self. Honor and worship your own being, for God dwells within you as you. The trouble is you think you're what you look at. You think you're your ego. I like this. I don't like that. And I can't believe he said that to me because that you think you're that. No, you're the one that's aware of that. See the difference? You are the pure consciousness that is aware of what you're looking at. But we'll talk in a moment. I promised I would. That's not all that easy to get off of that, is it? It has a pull, and it pulls you into it. I want to talk about what would happen if it didn't. That's what spirituality is, is what is the nature of self? It is pure bliss. It is pure ecstasy. It is nirvana. That's why they use the word nirvana. Where did the great masters go into that? Where did Christ go? Or maybe he was always there. When he said, my father and I are one, what does that mean? That he's there. He's merged with all consciousness. And so basically, as you come back to the seat of self, as opposed to what consciousness is shining on, as you come back to the seat of consciousness, you do indeed experience this energy. That energy has been called spirit. It's been called chi. It's been called shakti. 
and people feel it at different levels, the great masters, great masters of different traditions, experience that enough to intoxicate themselves. Ramakrishna, those pictures above the door over there. Oh, was he gone? Gone where? Into that energy. Since he was six years old, at six years old, he's walking through the paddy fields, and it was the monsoon season, so the sky was pitch black, and some ingrids, white flock of birds, flew across the black sky. You know how nature can knock you into a nice state, like the sunset can do that, right? He looked up at that and passed out. He just fell over backwards. For days, he stayed in that state. It wasn't until he was much older that they realized he was falling into the pure state of pure consciousness. He ended up being one of the greatest masters ever walked the face of the earth. As a grown man, every single day, one of his disciples had to walk behind him because at any moment, he would see something that made him think of God and his every hair on his body would stand on end. Tears would pour down his eyes. His arm would go up in the air in pure ecstasy and fall over backwards. So somebody has to walk behind the master. What we're talking about, what's back there is really high. It's really beautiful. And let's, let's go really crazy, all right? Ramakrishna, I don't know if he ever went to school. I don't know his whole history at that level, but he didn't graduate college or anything. They used to, surgeons would go to him, heart surgeons before surgery, prime ministers, the head of the countries would have him to dinner and come ask him advice. He was so clear. He had such a tie to something greater than himself that he just had all this wisdom and all this knowledge. It's a very great being. That's one great master. There are great masters, and you are it. Soham, I am he. That's who you are, not I am the scared and I'm afraid, and I don't like what he did. That's what you're doing with your eye, right? A great mantra is Soham, Soham, I am he, I am he. That's a whole different type of spiritual teaching, isn't it? I am he. My father and I are one. That's who you are at this moment. Not someday you'll meditate enough. Not someday you'll earn enough credits to graduate (laughs) to, to that level, right? If you are conscious, you're it. If you are aware of the mess that's going on inside of you, instead of getting all upset about it, you should be laughing. Because I, who am aware of that, is in a state of complete ecstasy at all times. How do I know that? Because sometimes you feel it. Sometimes something happens and you open and you feel love, don't you? And you feel joy and you feel inspiration and you feel all excited and you can take on the world. And sometimes you're like a wet dish rag. I can't do anything. I'm so tired. I'm so scared and I'm insecure, right or wrong. When you are open, meaning you're not focusing on the garbage that's down there, and you're not focusing on that stuff, you're going to think of yourself as whatever you're focusing on. And so if you focus on the garbage, you get drawn down. If somehow something nice happens, somebody says something nice to you, you get an A, you win the lottery, you get a new car, you get married, all kinds of nice things happen, don't they? During those times, you're open and you're more elevated. And so the consciousness doesn't get pulled down. And sometimes you love somebody, you're with them, and the first kiss or a hug or something, you can go bye-bye, can't you? The one I like the most is like this. Let's say you really love somebody and you haven't seen them for a while. And you really love. There's tremendous love pouring between them. And now you run and you hold each other. And you're just in it. When you're in it and it's happening to you, are your eyes open or closed? They're closed. Well, I thought you loved the guy. I thought you missed him. I don't understand. Because what's going on inside of you is so beautiful that you can't come out. You have to meditate to go there, do you? What is that that's going on inside of you? I'm telling you, it's there all the time. Well, how come it only happened when this guy or girl showed up? That's your psyche. Your psyche is programmed to only open under certain circumstances and close under other ones. So that's going on inside of you. But you're busy hanging out with the object instead of the subject. So now we've defined spirituality very deeply, haven't we? You are it. Tatwamasi, that's another Sanskrit. What does Tatwamasi mean? Thou art that. Isn't that beautiful? You in there who's looking at whatever you're looking at is the highest being that walked the face of the earth. Well, why don't I know that? Because you're busy identifying with what you're looking at instead of identifying with the one who's looking. Are we now clear? Because if you understand that, you understand spirituality. That is the essence of it. So what do I do about it? I'm not a big technique. I don't teach you how to meditate. I don't teach you all this stuff. Other people do, and that's wonderful. I don't teach you how to do yoga. I just teach you this stuff. I teach you why you would do yoga. I teach you why you would meditate. 
but you find your own techniques. You, you, know, you all figure out how to get dressed in the morning. You figure out how to go to school. You figure out how to drive a car. If you want to do it, you figure it out. You want to figure out who you are? Understand that you are getting drawn down into your thoughts and your emotions, and the world outside is affecting your thoughts and emotions, isn't it? It affects your thoughts and emotions, and then you get pulled down into them. So now you're lost in the objects of consciousness instead of centering, being seated in the seat of consciousness. So what do I do about that? Why am I not there? Because you're being pulled down into the object of consciousness. Why? Because it's a habit. It's a very, very strong habit. Ego is a very strong habit, isn't it? Somebody says something. Let's say you have a wonderful day. It's beautiful. Temperature's perfect. And somebody just invited you out that you always wanted to go out with, right? And then somebody shows up that you don't get along with and says something to you. You get upset. Why? Why were you willing to come down? You were up. Who cares what somebody says? You're doing wonderful, right? Or you're about to get married to somebody. And before the marriage ceremony, they feel that they, they, we should always be honest with each other, right? So just before the wedding, they tell you that they've been to jail, and they never told you that before. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> but you didn't tell me this. I didn't think it mattered. <laughs> so the pull of the personal, let's just call it the personal, the psyche, that which you're programmed. Let's say you were, you know, a wild held angel chick, and you know, somehow you fell in love. Someone's too straight, but you're doing it, and you had to leave all your friends, right? And then the guy tells you right before the wedding, "I really was a biker, and I was in jail for years. I just didn't tell you." Whoa, man, that's great! Come here. It could happen. It's like you're programmed. Your psyche is programmed based on your parents and your past experience and your preacher and rabbi and all the experiences you had. They programmed you. Remember what D.F. Skinner said? That's a behavioral psychologist. Man is the sum of his learned experiences. You are not the sum of your learned experiences. Your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. He's absolutely correct. Your mind and the behavior of your heart, your preferences and how you react to them is the sum of your learned experiences. And you're the one that's aware that that happens. You are the consciousness that's aware. Is the sum of your learned experiences hanging on inside of you? Mommy sometimes still talk and judge and daddy and the preacher and the first boyfriend. Is it not true that you can have an experience that hurt you when in high school and now it's 30 years later and you go to high school reunion and because you walk by the room where it happened or the locker that had your number where somebody put something in it that you freak out? Your psyche, your psyche, the sum of your thought patterns, your emotion patterns, they are the sum of your learned experiences. How do you know? Because I noticed that they do that. How do you know that when you looked at your locker, you got all weird? Because I'm in here. The same you've been talking about? Of course. So it's not true that you are the sum of your learned experiences. Your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. You are the consciousness, the awareness, the indwelling being. But psychology doesn't study that. They study what you're aware of, right? Which is wonderful. Somebody needs to study that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And therapists can help. It's all wonderful. And you'll get that help. But just understand that you don't need any help. You're in ecstasy no matter what. That is the state of your being. But you can be aware of a personal self that warns because somebody died or feels love because you're around someone that you feel more comfortable with. But just be aware. It's the same you that's aware of all this. So how do I work my way back to these higher spiritual states? You do it by noticing that you're noticing. That's called witness consciousness. Witness consciousness. I'm aware that my heart hurts. And if you say to me, what do I do about it? I know you don't want to hear the answer because I hope you don't have to do anything about it. What do you mean? Be aware that your heart hurts. Don't worry. It'll take a little time to work through the jealousy or the insecurity or the mourning because somebody died or somebody left you. That's how it is. You've got a human heart, don't you? You've got a human heart. It has human feelings, has human reactions, and you have a human mind. Have you ever noticed that the mind and the heart are in cahoots with each other? That if somebody says something, your heart gets all upset, your mind starts blah, 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 blah. Have you ever noticed that nobody has to say anything? You're minding your own business on a nature trail, and all of a sudden you see a leaf, and it reminds you of the fact that somebody gave you a gold leaf once, but then they left you. And the next thing you know, your mind's going, oh, I can't believe what did I do wrong? Your heart starts hurting. That's called witness consciousness. You're always aware. The trouble is you can't handle what you're aware of. How's that? I'm going to talk tough to you. Can you handle this stuff? And the answer is no. Somebody says something, you start getting defensive immediately. No, I did not say that. Why would you say it to me? Or he shouldn't have done that. I can't believe he left me. It was 20 years ago. 
Can you handle that that goes on inside of you? you in unison, no. <laughs> okay. That's why it pulls you into it. Because to you, that's a big deal that it says, I can't believe my parents got divorced. It's always bothered me. You're 75 years old. They got divorced when you were six. We can do better than that, can't we? No. No, I'm going on a blog for everyone whose parents got divorced and they're still over 70 years old. So it's a blog out there, I guarantee you. We're all going to feel sorry for each other. We're going to make a big deal out of it. Okay, go, do it. Doesn't mean that from a psychological point of view, that if you suppress things, it's not good to talk about them. Because it is. I'm not taking any of that away. I just want you to be able to come to some place where the highest truth is talked to you, which is you're the highest being walked the face of the earth. You're in a state of joy and ecstasy and love all the time from inside, regardless of what's going on outside. Why don't I know that? Because you're being pulled down into the garbage. You're being pulled down. If you suppress stuff in the past, and you all did, we all did, if you suppress stuff, it's still in there. And the stuff you tend to suppress is not the nice stuff, by the way. It's the stuff that hurt. It's the stuff that bothered you. And so you sit there and you push it down. The new book really goes into that, Living Untethered. When you push it down, it does. it's like pushing against a, a balloon. You push it down, it's going to want to come back up. Or trying to push something down in water. Take a balloon and push it down in water. What's going to happen? And you're going to try and come back up. That stuff you push down is always trying to come back up. You have to handle things. You can't push them down because they're going to keep trying to come back up. But we've always pushed them down, haven't we? Every single thing, every day we push stuff down. Somebody says something or doesn't say something, and it's right away, boom, that stuff's going to keep trying to come back up. That's why we can't let go. That's why we get pulled down in there because we're struggling in there, fighting with all the stuff we stored in there. So basically, as long as that's happening, your stuff's going to get hit. Soft spots, whatever you want to call it. Your stuff's going to get hit, and you're going to get pulled down into it because you can't handle it. So real quick, I'll give you the highest technique. Ready? Oh, I've never said this before. I told you I like to give techniques. I guarantee this technique will work every single time. You will become totally liberated and everything. You ready? Here's the technique. Handle it. <laughs> It's only a little funny because it's true. If the problem is that you can't handle it and you shove it down there and therefore it makes your mind sick and it makes your heart sick and you become sensitive and scared and insecure and everything has to be exactly the way you want for you to be okay, the answer is don't store that stuff down there. If you don't store the stuff down there, it's not going to have that power to pull you into it. Can you not store the stuff down there? Yes. Yes, you can. And the new book goes right down head first into that stuff. How do you not store the stuff down there? Don't start by trying to deal with the stuff that's already down there. That's way too hard. It's like, say, I'm going to play the piano. I'm going to play, you know, Beethoven first. But I never touch the keyboard. No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to do scales first, aren't you? So basically, you come down and you understand. You start with what I call the low-hanging fruit. The simple little things that happen all day that bother you. Have you noticed things bother you during the day? It's just like, wow, it's, they bother you. The driver in front of you, it's too hot, it's too cold. Oh my God, I got some ketchup on my pants, I got to go to work, and my hair is frizzy. Just anything, it all bothers you, doesn't it? My car seems to make a little squeak, what's that all about? I don't have any money, what am I going to do? Okay, we get bothered a lot during the day about things that if we didn't get bothered about them, wouldn't make any difference. And a minute later, they're gone. It's hot. We're in the air conditioning in a minute. The car has a squeak. Then it stops. And, and just all kinds of things happen all day. So you're sitting there bothering yourself. The driver's driving slow in front of you. Or he didn't use his blinker. That doesn't bother you. You're bothering yourself about it. That's where you start your spiritual journey. How do you like that? It's easier than asanas, easier than meditation, easier than reading all kinds of books forward and backwards. Just that's what I want you to do. I want you to go through the day without bothering yourself about things that have no meaning and you're going to find out your whole life changes. Because then what you're saying is, I understand that the reason I have a mess inside that keeps pulling me into it is because I stored things I couldn't handle. So let me at least start by not putting more in there. You can do it, can't you? Make it a game. It's a video game. Can I go through the day without bothering myself? You try. You start. That's a spiritual practice. How do you like that? It's a spiritual practice. You can use affirmation. You can think about other things. Just don't. Do you have hands in it to push things away? Do you have hands in it to push away thoughts and feelings? And so don't use them. That's the highest asana. Sit on them. 
sit on the inner hands. When you're doing an asana and it's tense, what does the teacher tell you to do? Relax through it. Relax into it. Relax through it. That's what I'm telling you to do with this stuff inside. Just relax. Just keep relaxing. Relaxing so that you're not pushing it down anymore. And what will happen is you'll start to go through days, and people write me all the time, I'm so much happier. I stop bothering myself about everything, and I'm not so bothered anymore. And so you start doing that, and then all of a sudden what's going to happen is something bigger will come up that you used to really get upset about. And now you look at it and you say, I don't have to get upset about that. It happened five years ago. (laughs) Why am I getting upset about it now? And you work with yourself to let it go. That's called letting go. I can handle this. That's your mantra. I can handle this. I can handle this. I can handle this. And you just start working on yourself. Keep letting go, letting go. And you're going to start to feel joy. You can start to feel for no reason. You just feel some joy coming up inside of you. Spontaneous joy. And you realize that's what we're talking about. If you don't get pulled down into the garbage, you get to float back into the ecstasy. And more and more, that's where you get your joy. Who said that to you? Christ. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that leaveth the mouth of God. That energy inside is divine spiritual light of energy. And so as you let go of getting pulled down into your stuff, you float back into your higher self. And more and more, it just happens. It happens every I want every day to be your spiritual practice. If you will do this, I guarantee your whole life will change. Doesn't mean you don't get married. Sure, life unfolds. You dance with it. But in here, you're letting go. You're just realizing, I'm in here, and I am capable of feeling joy all the time, love all the time, inspiration all the time. You'll find out you're smarter than you thought you were. Take your SATs again when you don't have all that stuff going on inside of you. If you straighten this stuff up, you're going to find out you're smarter. Your memory works better. Everything. You know, how about health? Don't they teach you now in alternative medicine and, and holistic medicine that your thoughts can affect your body? That you can mess up your energy flow and things can get sick and so on? Well, what happens if you didn't do that? But I mean, you have all this anxiety inside. The reason you have anxiety inside is because you put it there. You shoved all this stuff down inside and now you're afraid of yourself. Are you afraid of your thoughts? Afraid of your feelings? Yes. Okay. So there, we talked about it. I've always wanted to talk about it from the highest place first. You're a great being. And that means you, not some you you haven't found yet. You who's looking out through those eyes. You who's feeling the heart. You who's noticing the thoughts. You're a great being. The trouble is you get pulled down into this lower stuff. Learn to handle life. Learn to handle situations. Learn to not suppress things. Learn to release them when they come back up. If you can do this, you're going to elevate yourself to a beautiful level until eventually, I'm telling you, you will feel ecstasy. You will feel joy welling up inside of you. You are a great being. Everything will open. All the centers will open. You'll become a being of energy, a being of light. How? By letting go of staring at what's not a being of energy. All right. Boy, if you understand these things, I did my job. I'm serious. Not, not that you can do them. You won't do them tomorrow. You work on it. It's the work of a lifetime to reach these very high states. And by the way, you don't just benefit yourself. Look, when you go to somebody who's depressed, is it fun to be around them? Doesn't it pull you down? What about you going around with somebody who's high and all that good, beautiful love energy is pouring? It lifts everything, doesn't it? Be that. Be that. Be a great being. Raise yourself. Work on this. Mm, Jagger.